Hello and welcome to Law of the Cards, the series that looks to find the lore hidden in your Hearthstone deck. Well, it's been a long, gruelling journey, battling Dark Iron Dwarves, Fire Elementals, Black Rock Orcs and Black Dragons, but we made it. The final wing of the Black Rock Mountain adventure. The Hidden Laboratory, which to World of Warcraft players will be more commonly known as the Raid Blackwing Descent. When we last left off, the mighty acting ruler of the Black Dragons, Nefarian, had just been put to the sword, putting his devious experiments to create a new dragonflight to an end. Nefarian's body was not exactly treated with respect after his death. His massive head was hacked from his neck and dragged all the way back to the faction capital of the heroes that slew him. The gruesome visage was put on display for all to see. Recognising a major threat to their kingdom had been vanquished, the warriors and citizens' hearts ignited with pride and gained a new determination to always stand steadfast against those that threaten their safety. They would need this newfound conviction for the many other threats the world of Azeroth would face. The threat of Illidan's Stormrage from the world of Outland, the demon lord killed Jaden trying to cross over to their world, and the incredibly powerful Lich King. All of these threats were vanquished, but one of the greatest was yet to come. The elements of Azeroth were thrown into unrest, the land being plagued with sudden earthquakes and portals allowing aggressive elementals through. But these signs were merely a herald of what was to come. The return of Deathwing. The mighty dragon aspect was stirring in the elemental plane of Deepholm, recovered from his defeat many years prior, and even more powerful than before. More adamantite plates affixed to his body, struggling to keep his power under control. Deathwing travelled from Deepholm to Azeroth, his sudden arrival from one realm to the other causing an event that would forever change the face of Azeroth, the Cataclysm. Azeroth buckled and broke, the land tearing apart, but even in the midst of this tragedy, new life was born, once arid regions becoming lush with vegetation. One of Deathwing's first acts after his return was to use his extremely potent magic to reanimate the most powerful of his children, Nefarian. How Deathwing managed to get hold of Nefarian's disembodied head is a bit of a mystery. When he first arrived in Azeroth, he almost immediately travelled to the human kingdom of Stormwind to announce his return to the world. It's a possibility that while here, he wrenched his son's head from the chains that bound it to one of Stormwind's stone archways, and then recovered the rest of Nefarian's body from the Black Rock Mountain. However, in contradiction to this theory, the orc war hero Varok Sawafang remembers impaling the dragon's head upon a spike, which would have meant it was displayed in the orc capital of Orgrimmar, which Deathwing did not visit on his return. Either way, the terrifying Nefarian was back from the dead, his full intelligence and awareness restored. While Nefarian's brain had not yet rotted, the rest of his body had begun to, giving his once jet black scales a more pallid hue and his ribs gruesomely protruded from his body. With a rotten body, it would be logical to assume that Nefarian in this new state would be weaker than before. However, the dragon was in fact stronger than ever, possibly gifted this additional power by his father. If anything, Nefarian was now more terrifying, a hideously deformed body with an extremely keen and devious mind. Deathwing had not resurrected Nefarian out of sentiment or any platonic love, but had brought him back to continue his research that had previously been interrupted carving and cutting up the other dragonflights in an attempt to create an even more powerful being. Being returned from the dead after suffering a humiliating defeat to mere mortals, Nefarian no doubt seethed with rage. Rather than act on his impulse and attack immediately, striking back at those that had defeated him before, death had made Nefarian wiser. 
He had been able to curb his previous vices of hubris and arrogance, and rather than emerge from his lair all guns blazing, Nefarian actually secluded himself further within the spire of Black Rock Mountain. There he patiently experimented and researched in the hope that he could aid his father in the destruction of all life on Azeroth. Despite being discreet, rumours began to circulate of Nefarian's return, adventurers soon catching wind of the worm's new experiments that were even more abhorrent than the ones he had previously created. It was not long until heroes stormed the dragon's lair in an attempt to put him down once and for all. With his newfound caution, Nefarian did not meet the heroes head on, or keep his finest work at the entrance of his lair. He put defences in place, keeping his best work and himself hidden from view, using failed experiments to fight the heroes first. The first two battles the heroes would encounter in Nefarian's lair are both a part of the first battle in the Hearthstone adventure. Nefarian's defences clearly worked, proclaiming to those that entered, I do hope this raid entertains me more than the last. With the mountain now cleared of Ragnaros, who coincidentally now worked for the Black Dragon's father, Nefarian was able to investigate the area unhindered. A lot of Dark Irons too had left the mountain, following Moira Thaurasan to Ironforge. Moira left the mountain because her father, King Magni, had become encased in diamond making her the rightful ruler of her people. Upon arrival in Ironforge, she ruled tyrannically, stopping all dwarves from leaving the city. This also meant that any visitors from other kingdoms were unable to leave too, one of whom was Anduin Rin. Anduin escaped and informed his father Varian, who attacked Ironforge to liberate the dwarves and assassinate Moira. Before the human king could strike the final blow, Anduin stopped him, he had learnt why Moira had resented her father so much, and requested his father help her become a better leader, rather than kill her. After all, without a clear heir to the Dwarven Kingdom, this could spark another Dwarven civil war. Varian agreed with his son's logic, but in order to keep Moira in check, he formed the Council of the Three Hammers, giving all Dwarven clans equal rule within the Kingdom. Moira's uncle Muradin represented the Bronzebeards, and Falstad represented the Wildhammer. The Dark Iron Dwarves that remained in Blackrock were those that had not been able to bring themselves to follow Moira, since she was once a part of the Bronzebeard clan, still deeply bitter of their defeat during the War of the Three Hammers. Because the remaining Dark Irons could pose little resistance to an even more powerful Nefarian, he found it easy to claim the Omnitron defence system for his own. Centuries ago, the defence system used to be one of the Dark Iron's greatest technological marvels. Four mechanical golems, each with a unique skill set. They were possibly set aside when Ragnaros discovered the ability to bring life to stone, creating a new type of golem. Nefarian saw the flaws within the defence system. The golems charged their power, meaning that only a maximum of two could attack at any one time. The golems were also specialised to a particular fighting method, so with only two up at a time, it was easy to discover and exploit the weaknesses of those in combat. Despite knowing the flaws, Nefarian was distracted by more important experiments, and so he left the flawed golems near the entrance of his lair to wipe out the weakest of the raids that tried to attack him. Each golem of the defence system possessed a unique magical skill. In Hearthstone, each individual golem is activated with the hero power, being sparked to life one by one, much like they were in Warcraft. When the raid engaged the defence system, only one golem was operational, possibly another flaw with the system to keep the mechanics ticking over. That meant the golem first fought would be totally random and could be any one of the following. The purple etched Arcanatron possessed the ability to use the power of the Arcane. Arcanatron was able to sling concentrated energy blasts of the magic to damage his foes, and able to convert damage done to him into further power, casting faster and dealing more damage. The Golem was also able to place runes on the floor, which empowered him and his allies, increasing their strength, but also strengthening adversaries that stood within them. 
Nefarians strengthened Arcanatron's runes, but this was a double-edged sword, as his opponents also benefited from the greater boost. If the heroes became too comfortable standing in the runes for a prolonged time, they would explode, killing all caught within the blast. It is Arcanatron's runes that inspire his card design in Hearthstone, increasing the magical potency of his allies, but also buffing the enemy hero. When Electron entered the fray, the heroes needed to spread out, as he was able to electrically charge them to damage nearby allies. All of the golem's electrical abilities behave like this, spreading to those that stood too close together. As the battle went on, Nefarian was able to attack those that had been made into lightning conductors by Electron, afflicting the conductor with shadow energy instead. This completely flipped Electron's ability, causing it to harm heroes further away. In Hearthstone, Electron makes spells cost three less for the defense system, a clever way of incorporating his area of effect abilities into the game, making it easier to cast these devastating spells. The flame-wielding Magmatron also used his abilities to damage several heroes within the raid, but rather than use the heroes as conduits, the fire blasted from the construct itself. It was able to vent flames across the entire chamber and protected itself in a barrier that absorbed damage and exploded when penetrated. Magmatron was aided by Nefarian to acquire targets for his massive flamethrower. When he locked on, Nefarian was able to use his shadow magic to root the hero to the spot. In Hearthstone, Magmatron's acquired targets are any enemy cards that enter the field of battle, receiving two damage as they enter. The final golem was Toxitron, using chemical weaponry to spread deadly poison throughout the raid. This poison could also form into slime that would pick a hero to hunt down and engulf them if not stopped. Toxitron's weakness was that his clouds of poison could be moved away from. Nefarian tried to rectify this by secretively teleporting to the middle of one and casting his magic to drag the heroes into it. In Hearthstone, Toxitron's poisonous presence is represented in his ability to deal one damage to all other minions on the board at the start of the defense system's turn, as his poison also damaged allies. The defense system was not the only protection Nefarian had in place to defend his lair. What was a separate fight in Warcraft has been incorporated into the defense system fight for Hearthstone, the armor-plated lava worm Magmor. The giant beast had been summoned from the Firelands by the Dark Iron centuries ago and had been sliding his way through the mountain ever since, too feral for them to command as protection for their master Ragnaros. When first learning of the Elemental's existence, Nefarian was annoyed, knowing that it could interrupt his delicate work. However, Nefarian has been able to tame Magmor as much as one possibly can. The Great Dragon found that the worm could be useful in devouring his failed experiments, and he could also throw all that failed him into the worm's hungry jaws. Nefarian Strachnoids have been able to chain Magmor in place, but the beast does not fight too hard against his restraints, as it has found Nefarian's laboratory to be quite a welcoming restaurant. The heroes slew Magmor's captors, but the worm did not flee. Perhaps he was hungry. The monster spewed lava over his new attackers and flung his hulking form towards the ground in an attempt to crush them. Magmor was also capable of summoning lava parasites that hungered for the warm flesh of any hero that they could burrow into. Despite being heavily armoured, Magmor did have a weakness. The chains left behind by the slain Drachnoid could be attached to the worm's pincers, and the heroes pulled with all their might to drive a spike found on the floor of the worm's chamber through its head. Even with a metal spike impaled through his head, Magmor did not die, but his armour was weakened, allowing the heroes to attack the exposed point. If Magmor looked like he was in danger, Nefarian aided his pet, summoning even more flaming minions to attack the raid, and complementing the worm's lava spit with his own shadow breath. Unfortunately for Nefarian, Magmor took one too many spikes to the head and was defeated. 
With Nefarian's entrance guardians vanquished, the heroes were able to progress into the main body of Nefarian's laboratory, a large circular room with a pit of lava at its centre. Again, dragons grimly hooked from the rafters. Three corridors splayed out from this central chamber, each housing one of Nefarian's twisted creations. The one that does not make it to the Hearthstone adventure is the mutated Hydra Chimeran, a hideous amalgamation of flesh stitched together by Nefarian, creating a brutal and quick to anger beast. In one of the foremost chambers, the heroes would encounter the experiment seen in the Hearthstone adventure's second encounter, Meloriac. Nefarian regards Meloriac as a failed experiment, an attempt to combine a human with a dragon spawn. Nefarian kidnapped a gifted young alchemist called Mallory, who doesn't show up in Warcraft lore before this point, and bound him with a corpse of one of his dragon spawn. Perhaps Nefarian's aim was to strengthen the otherwise weak alchemist, but give a dragonkin the keen intelligence of the youth. However, this backfired. Mallory was stronger than before, but his intellect degraded substantially. Despite his intellect being reduced, Meloriac still possessed some skill in alchemy, and this can be seen in his hero power, swapping the attack and health of a minion that enters play, much like the crazed alchemist card. He also prepared some potent concoctions in his cauldron to fight heroes that attacked him. Throwing vials in gave him different powers. His red vials gave him the power of flame blue ice, and his green vial would coat his attackers in a slime that would eat through their armour. In his battle with the heroes, Meloriac would also release his many failed experiments. Mutated dragon aberrations would be released from their experimental containers to attack. This is once again shown in Hearthstone with the ability Release the Aberrations, summoning a few weak but nasty little minions. Watching his experiment fight the heroes, Nefarian was unimpressed, and added another ability to Meloriac's cauldron, infecting it with shadow magic. Meloriac reacted violently, spewing up black slime that infected the adventurers with dark magic. Near death, Meloriac panicked, releasing all his experiments, including his successful prime draconids, and his cauldron bubbled out of control, Meloriac throwing fire, ice and poison magics out over the raid. After killing Meloriac, Nefarian was unimpressed with the hero's victory, giving them a title of his own. Slayer of stupid, incompetent and disappointing minions, a title referenced in Hearthstone with Meloriac's defeat. The heroes then moved to the final experiment's chamber and were greeted by dwarven spirits, who were the past rulers of the Dark Iron Empire. Anger Forge, Anvil Rage, Burning Eye, Core Hammer, Iron Star, Molten Fist, Shadow Forge, and the summoner of Ragnaros himself, the Sorcerer Thane, Thalrissan. After putting these spirits to rest, the heroes were greeted by a vision. It was Meloriac who accidentally created the second last encounter in the Hearthstone adventure, while showing what he thought would be an incredible invention to Nefarian on a Black Whelp test subject. Ah, Meloriac. How gracious of you to finally appear from that quarantine you call a laboratory. What have you got this time? My sincerest apologies for the disturbance, my liege. What? I believe I have something you may be very interested in. By all means, enlighten me. Yes, yes! By extracting agents from the blood of various dragon flights, I have created a salve that will bestow the wearer's sight beyond sight! Senses beyond this realm of mortality! Atromedes! Your master beckons! It appears as though your experiment has failed. That Whelp has gone completely blind. Look at him. Look at him! As he grew older, the blinded Whelp Atromides adapted to his new handicap. 
the dragon's hearing became more acute, and he would use sound waves to detect his prey. This is displayed in Hearthstone with the blind worm's hero power, Echo Locate, giving Atramides a weapon that grows even more powerful the more cards he hears played. This happened while Atramides fought the heroes, sending out sound waves to help detect them. The closer and closer the dragon came to discovering their precise location, the more danger the heroes were in. For if he pinpointed it exactly, the dragon was so powerful and precise he could kill his attacker with a single blow. Nefarian looked to aid the dragon he had once spared from death summoning shadowy imps that attached themselves to the heroes and made a racket, helping Atromides locate his targets. Unfortunately, the room Atromides was placed in put the drake at a huge disadvantage. He was summoned to the room by a large bell, which he soon melted to put an end to its deafening sound. Atromides had several techniques where he would blast his attacker with concentrated flames, which helped him gain a better idea of their location. But the heroes were able to interrupt the dragon's concentration by hitting several gongs placed in his chamber. This disoriented Atromides, meaning that after destroying the gong, he had to begin his hunt all over again, represented in Hearthstone with the destruction of his weapon. The blinded dragon never did get a proper lock on the heroes before he was slain. Despite trying his best to aid his minions, Nefarian was the only one left standing in his lair. Or so it seemed. He had one more experiment to reveal, his finest work. Emerging from the lava at the centre of his lab was the reconstructed body of his sister, Anixia, who was brought back to life with a spark of electricity. Anixia's reanimation was not as perfect as Nefarian's, seeming to have lost her intelligence and the power of speech, but Nefarian had made a few modifications to make her an extremely dangerous force in battle. The heroes quickly jumped down to stop the menace of Anixia being reintroduced to Azeroth. As Anixia attacked, the nodes up the side of her body gathered power. Nefarian's alteration meant that Anixia not only hit like a 10 ton truck, but could blast pure electricity from the nodes on her body. Nefarian further aided his sister by summoning the bone constructs the heroes had fought in their first battle with the dragon all those years ago. Anixia is in Hearthstone too, being aided by her brother with her hero power. Nefarian's bone constructs also make an appearance as his hero power, but that is when he enters the fight. Seeing that his invention risked destruction, Nefarian rushed to his sister's aid, but ultimately was too late to stop the heroes. In a rage, Nefarian spat Shadow Flame across the raid, reanimating any slain bone constructs caught within the blast. He was also able to temporarily flood the room with lava and be aided by his chromatic prototypes. At least one of these needed to be slain to end the flooding. The lava mechanic and the prototypes see an appearance in Hearthstone too. After a furious battle, Nefarian was finally slain. For good. But Nefarian's legacy did not end there. His greatest invention, Chromatus, the first and only perfect chromatic drake that Nefarian was never able to bring to life, was animated. This beast, that was even larger than some of the dragon aspects, would go on to wreak havoc. But that's another story for another day. So, there you have it, the end of our journey the final wing of the Black Rock Mountain. Thank you so much to everyone that has watched this mini-series, and a massive thank you to the Hearthstone community team for approaching me, especially Keg and me, for all the extra support. Like, subscribe, and share if you've enjoyed, and you can check out the artists in the description below. In a week or two's time, I hope to have completed Vol'jin's storyline, and will finally get an epic episode up for you. All your support has pushed this channel further than I ever thought possible, and I can't thank you enough. Till next time, happy hearthstoning, and I'll see you soon for more Lore of the Cards.